The official purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to test and observe the effects of extended isolation on the human mind. This is what was listed on the reports being sent out at least. But unbeknownst to all those who were not participating in the project, excluding the subjects, the true purpose was much darker. Like I said before, Zimmerman had always had an obsession with the occult and supernatural. He sought to prove himself to those who did not believe in him. He wanted physical proof that the supernatural was a real phenomenon, and he wanted to be the first one to obtain said proof. The true purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to find proof of the metaphysical, a world we could not see. The thought of doing this was naturally a tad bit daunting and even scary, but it was Zimmerman's method of doing so that was truly terrifying. Zimmerman believed that he would be able to open a portal between worlds momentarily, allowing three random entities to cross over to our world, and each one of these beings would be trapped within one of the three rooms. Zimmerman had the theory that any entity would try and latch onto the nearest living thing that had the capacity for it. He wanted to use this technique to trap a spirit in a physical form by allowing it to enter a living being that had been injected with a compound mixture of Zimmerman's creation. In theory, this compound would keep the entity from leaving whatever it was attached to. The only way it would be able to leave a host who had been injected with the compound was through death. According to Zimmerman, the host would have to be something living with a will strong enough to survive the possession, and there is only one known species that possesses the amount of will required for this. Humans. Zimmerman had also done something to ensure that the entities would only enter the three rooms, and that there would only be one entity in each room though I cannot say I know what exactly he did. In fact, I know next to nothing when it comes to how Zimmerman managed to do what he did. He liked to keep his methodology a secret to his most trusted and himself, most likely due to his paranoia that someone would steal his ideas and take credit for the success of said ideas. If I had known that this was the true purpose before I signed up, I may have reconsidered. But Zimmerman decided not to tell us until we were all gathered at his fortress. Even if any of us wanted to leave, I doubt we would have been allowed to do so. The security team Zimmerman had hired was loyal to him, and the payout, it is not unlikely that Zimmerman had given them the order to not allow anyone to leave. There were three different subjects included in the experiment. All were native to Alaska, and each one was lured into the project under the belief that they would be participating in a harmless study of the effect of isolation on the human mind, as I mentioned before. Which is why none of the subjects objected when they realized that they would be confined to one of three rooms that I mentioned earlier. The first subject was a young man. He was apparently out of work and desperately needed the money that had been offered for participating in the study. The second was a woman. By looking at her, I could tell that she was an addict of some sort. The third and final subject was an older man, a drifter, if I had to guess. One thing that they all had in common was that none of them had any family or friends left. In short, no one would miss them, which is why they were chosen for the project. 
I am sorry. I wish I could supply more information about the subjects, but all of this has been drawn from memory, and I was given so little information on the three to begin with. The experiment did not officially begin until 1987, 16 years after its initial announcement. I was eager to begin, so I packed up and headed out to the complex as soon as I could. I arrived at the compound a week before the subjects had even signed up, and a whole month before the project even began. I was not the first to arrive by any means. When I got there, Zimmerman, his colleagues, and the security team had already arrived. I suppose you could say I was the first among the people Zimmerman did not trust to arrive. Everyone had arrived about a week before the experiment began. There was a noticeable rift between those who were there simply for the money, like me, and those who were followers of Zimmerman. On October 15th, 1987, all the preparations were in place. The subjects had been sealed in their rooms. The cameras, lights, and speakers were fully operational, and all the staff members had settled in. The time had come for the experiment to officially begin. Zimmerman asked everyone to report to the control room around 9 p.m. to witness the beginning of the experiment. He wanted everyone to be present when he proved that all of his theories had been correct and that he was not just a madman. He wanted all of us to see the fruits of his labor. When everyone had finally gathered in the large control room, Zimmerman turned to us and simply said, Observe. He then turned his back to us, leaned into the microphone that would project his voice through the three rooms, and then he began chanting in a strange language that I feel certain no one but Zimmerman could understand. We all observed the three large monitors on the wall, silently waiting for something to happen. The subjects all stood in their room, dumbstruck by Zimmerman's chanting staring at the monitors with confused expressions on their faces. After about five minutes, I felt something awful. I cannot explain what exactly it was, but a horrible feeling of dread washed over me, riddling me with fear. It was then that the ground actually began to shake subtly and the lights began to flicker. Zimmerman continued chanting into the microphone as if nothing was wrong or off while the subjects began dashing around their rooms, screaming for help. Then, suddenly, the ground stopped shaking and the monitor's image turned into static. The air began to become very heavy as we all stared at the monitors waiting for them to regain their image and show us what was happening or had happened in those three rooms. For a while, all was silent. But then, there was screaming. The screams of a woman going through unbearable pain and terror began to echo through the compound. The similar screams of men began to coincide with the woman's terrified screams, and together they mixed into an awful symphony of pain and fear that beat mercilessly into our ears. Those of us who were here for the money began to give each other scared looks, while those loyal to Zimmerman seemed completely unfazed. We wanted to leave leave and never come back to this awful place but we knew we all knew deep down that zimmerman would never allow that to happen we were here for the long haul 
there was no escape.